Howdy, ho, ho, my good humans. How the hell are you doing? This is Unnecessary Rambling. I am Brandon Sylvia. I appreciate you for joining me. Appreciate you, Loon, for joining me here today to do some video game rankings. How you feeling, man? How you living? Yeah, it's been a bit of good old month. Um, Space Marine 2 finally got it in my hands. So that's been that's been a hell of a lot of fun waiting for that for what is it, ten plus years for me? So yeah, Crazy, tons man. of uh, tons of other titles that we've kicked off our list. Yeah, dude, been a very very big month. Um, very packed month for new game releases, and October is looking like another stack month. So excited to get around to October um but first we got to talk about the games we played in September so uh we got a pretty packed list here don't want to waste too much of your time um I guess I'll go ahead and kick it off since I I big big month of of games checked off the old checked off the old list here we got Star Wars Outlaws I talked about this a lot last month um I really enjoyed Star Wars Outlaws a lot. I was hot on it last month, and I think I'm quite a bit hotter on it after finishing it. The story took a massive leap forward, and by the end, it's kind of like one of those nail-biter stories. It brings in some interesting family dynamics, um, things that I weren't uh, things that I wasn't really expecting from a slightly more emotional standpoint. Because really, when I talked about it last month, I don't know if you felt this way, Loon, when we were talking about it. Like, I was having a hard time connecting with the story, but I really liked everything else about the game. I was like, everything else about the game is great, but the story was just kind of so-so. Um, and then, yeah. yeah, and then the story really, really ramped up at the end of the game, and it it still keeps in intact the huge action heist movie kind of Michael Bay esque shit there. But it, it it gets a little bit more emotional, and uh, I I I really did appreciate that. And I also did find the um, the where you take Nick's out to the eating mm. to the little mini games. Some of the cutest, <laughs> some of the cutest shit I've ever seen in a game, man. It was so cool. Off in the end, though, that's the main important thing. You just you lagged out big, big time there. I, oh, you, sorry. I was... it, Go ahead. It cut out like was, probably 10, 15 seconds of what you just said. I was just saying that's amazing that you found the minigame thing. And then yeah. I said, um, it's good to, it has a payoff then because the opening of the story is like really weak, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. It, it doesn't start off strong whatsoever. It, it picks up in a big way towards the end of the game. Um, but I, I think that f the thing that was probably the thing that I, appreciate the most is as the game goes on they rely on that forced stealth shit less and less as well so it mm. just kind of consistently gets better and better and better it's a very slow burn um but it, it it does get better and the reputation system that actually does have a payoff in the game i was worried that that was just going to be kind of like a throwaway nothing burger and you know for the most part like it doesn't have huge implications throughout the entire story but it does have a a specific moment where it, it has some payoff and you know you do get gear and different rewards for siding with one faction over another and and you can actually go back and go through those different factions and do quests for these factions and go and gain like the VIP best gear for each of them. And so there, there is a benefit to doing that stuff. Um, yeah. And, you know, just being able to go into their different little hub bases, the factions hub bases and be able to like steal pretty much right in front of these people because they're not suspecting you. Like, obviously you have to mm. kind of try to disguise yourself a little bit, <laughs> but if you're, if you're in good with the hut syndicate, you can kind of just roam around the hut faction, their, their little camps. And so if you need to go steal an item from the huts and give it to a different faction, it's like, okay. You just walk right in and you see the, the item sitting there on the table. And as long as nobody's like staring directly at you, just whoop, pocket that bitch real quick. And you go and take it back to the Pike syndicate or whoever the hell you want to sell the, sell the merchandise to. And it's cool that throughout the game, there'll be, Oh, I just stole that thing from the, the hut cartel. Now the Pike are contacting me saying, Hey, well come give it to me instead of giving, giving it to this other faction. Because, yeah. Yeah. That shit's sick, man. Yeah. I had that. That was that was cool. Do you think she, her character arc is good? In the end, do you think there's a good payoff for her? Because, she, like I said, she was very dull in the beginning. Does she have her moment, and then 
payoff. I think that the family dynamic that they introduce with her really elevates her. It, it, it makes you invested in her emotionally and wanting to see her succeed. But I think it's the problem with this game that is the problem with a lot of other Ubisoft games where their human character models are awful. And it's hard to get invested into a AAA game that's trying to present itself as, you know, this realistic, you know, big budget third person action adventure game. And your character models look like, you know, a double A game. A yeah. And and it's just it is what it is. I, I, I don't I, I don't understand why they're so far behind the eight ball with their character models. But I do think that she has a redeeming character arc. And I do think that by the end of the game, I was rooting for her much more than I was uh, towards the beginning of the game. But I, there there are still massive complaints I have with the game. I think not highlighting how good of a third-person shooter this is was really stupid. I, it's a very, very, very good third-person shooter. Like, very fun. And when you start, you know, you get your different... Um, like, you can uh, have more health equipped. Or, like, your, your stem packs. You can have more of those throughout the game as you unlock different uh, upgrades. You can carry more stem packs with you. And so, whenever you have five of these stem packs, you're just go i don't get catch me if you want to i'm gonna be reviving myself and i'm blasting these damn stormtroopers and like it goes crazy over the top action and in those moments you know you you got a zip line that you're gliding down you're sliding into cover blasting somebody different explosive barrels all over the place like it becomes a fun romp but it, it was almost like they wanted to get real serious like with their stealth and and make it feel I, I, I get that you don't want her to be this ultra badass because it's not like she's some Jedi. It's not like she's some Sith Lord or like she's just a normal human who is trying to survive, trying to smuggle, trying to stay alive, trying to make it. And I, I get that. But at the end of the day, it's a video game and the third person shooting mm -hmm. is really damn fun and the stealth just isn't. It, it, and it's not even that the stealth is it is what it is, but there's no mechanical like it's you, you can't like go up and grab people and you can't interrogate them or tackle them to the ground. Like there's no real cool stealth mechanics. Whereas the third person shooting is just excellent across the board, dropping it. And it's not like overly loot driven. So you're not having to think about all that. Shit. I'm going to go up to the body and I'm going to do it. But you know, you see an enemy with a dope ass gun and you run up and you just grab the gun in the spur of the moment. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, Oh, I just unlocked something. And now I, it's really not like that. You don't have tons of skill trees and tons of loot and, and all this shit that you're having to worry about. It's just a fun game. And if they would have leaned into that more, I, I well, you never fucking know with the internet because they're mad about everything all the time. But <laughs> I, I think it would have been better, better received if it wasn't so stealth dependent. Yeah, I think as well, what would have helped it in particular is not front loading the worst ideas and the weakest parts of the game at the very beginning. Like, we've been over this time and time again. First impressions. Why on earth you did so many forced stealth sections? And it's not even just forced stealth sections. It's forced stealth sections with no room for error. It's a game yeah. over straight back to the start. And it's just like, okay. This well, is very jarring. It's like we talked about... Uh, it's like we talked about with dragon age you know with that reveal trailer it's like that's going to be your first impression of this hundred billion dollar game that you're wanting to trot out there and then with outlaws four hours until you get your ship and your speeder bike and four hours until you're really on in the thick of things like are you out of your mind do you know how short people's attention spans are these days get to the good shit come on man do you know what? i'll throw starfield a bone here while, while yes. we're talking about that they they cut that fat and gave you your spaceship within the first hour. It was you, you have your little story segment, and then it's just like, if you want to go to the main city, you can, or you can just go explore the stars immediately. So, good on them for that. Totally, dude. I, I, I totally agree. I don't think Starfield gets enough credit for a bunch of different things, but yeah, I, I'm going to go Outlaws. Overall, I think that, uh, I mean, it's an A-tier game for me, easily. I, I definitely have complaints with it, but it's a game of the year contender, no doubt, for me, with without a shadow of a doubt. Damn, strong praise. I really, really enjoyed it. But I, I, I like I like Ubisoft games. I mean, th <laughs> think less of me, if you will. <laughs> you want to hit one of yours real quick, man? Uh, we can start with Mirage, yeah. Right. Um. 
played it, played it at launch and uh, bounced off of it. Yeah, I find that a lot. It's why I struggled with um, when I did the list last month. It's what I'm going to try and get better at. I'm only going to be bringing in things that either I'm like really deep into or I've finished because Mirage was one of them where I played it at launch for the opening hour and didn't really, it didn't grab me. I don't really like Bayek as a character. And although they scaled things back to try and like shorten the length, which is good, they improved on that. It's, it's one that I 100% and it was a I think it's twenty hours, one hundred percent instead of Odyssey and stuff, where it's one hundred and twenty. Right. So they've seriously cut back that. But again, it's Bayek just sucks. <laughs> no, it's not Bayek. It's Basim. Sorry, Basim. Bayek is uh, Origins. Basim just sucks because you're going to tell me you're going to make a game about him in his Origins, where he's at his weakest. You've already shown me in. Valhalla at his strongest. Right. Because it's the big thing of like when you're telling a story about somebody, is this the most interesting part of their life? And if that's not, why are you not telling me that? Because it's meant to be enjoyable. You know, it's a lot of that opening is very, very weak. The middle is very weak. And then the payoff, if you've played Valhalla, you already know where it's going. So there's no twist. So it's very strange that you've decided to. It feels rehashing the story almost because he did. He played a huge part in Valhalla. He was a little bit to the background, but you know, you've already explored his story and then you want to do it again. And it's it's not like this is a Ezio or something where he's charismatic and he's a good character and stuff. He's just not. Yeah. So it was played... one of the things where, sorry, no, it was one ahead. of the things where um, obviously Shadows is on the horizon. So I wanted to just get it out of the way more than anything. It's not something that I was really itching to play. So, yeah. Where would you rank it? I, I played a, about five, six hours of it. I, I bounced off of it pretty quickly. That's the thing, like, ranking it in, like, the Assassin's Creed series or on its own as, like, an individual game? Just as an individual game. I mean, however you would like to rank it. I mean, just as in we're doing this ranking here today. Well, for this ranking, it's, uh, I'd probably say it's a C. If I'm being 100 percent honest, because th the only pure positive is the length that they sorted out. Everything else was it didn't feel good, and they really need. This is why I'm excited for Shadows. The movement system looks so much more fluid. Yeah, because I don't understand how they peaked in Unity for the best free running, and then they've gone backwards since. They've scaled it back, scaled it back, scaled it, back. and then in this, it's frustrating. You're trying, you're trying to tell him to do. So you can't even do something that you could do in Assassin's Creed One, which is what a 2006 seven game. Right. Where you run up a wall, and then you turn your character so that he jumps to the left. He doesn't do that in this game, and it's baffling because it's so frustrating. It's so restrictive, and it yeah. yeah, it it just for a game that has parkour as DNA for it to be so bad and simplified have it you 100 percented yeah. pretty much all the assassin's creeds uh no i i've beat all of them oh wow you've beat every single one barring the chronicles games and funnily enough the first game wow i i, I never finished assassin <laughs> i didn't find it i didn't find it enjoyable to play i need to go back and finish it one day i'm, I'm holding out for like a remake or something right it's, it's a it's, you know very very old and cryptic <laughs> yeah. in its design but um funny. the first one i did was uh odyssey it hooked me like no every shit. part about every part about that game just spoke to me it's i love greek mythology so and the just, first one that you 100 percented or the first one you ever finished in general was Odyssey? No, the first one 100 percent Oh, okay. I was like, yo, you went back to all of them. I <laughs> damn, that's a journey. No, uh the first one I finished was Black Flag on the 360. Me and a friend, like it was given to you in uh, Games of Gold. And we spent the entire weekend racing each other who could finish the most out of it. And that was yeah. That was when I just fell in love with the series. That's dope, man. Um, 
All right, so C tier for Mirage. Ubisoft got one win and one one L. <laughs> <laughs> so now let's head over to old Astro Land. Talk a little bit about the bot, the little Astro. Um, I know everybody is is talking about this as game of the year contender. A lot of people locking it in as their game of the year. And uh, I definitely agree that it's a contender for game of the year. It's not my game of the year. I enjoyed it. Nice, fun, simple platformer with a lot of added difficulty for the, you know, they have like the circle levels and the square levels and the triangle levels. And it's like super, super challenging. Um, and those that I did were enjoyable and, and just adding a little bit of spice, a little bit of more, you know, challenge into the mix there. My big thing, I, I love the game. But I'm not a big collect-a-thon guy at all. I much prefer like an action platformer, something akin to a Ratchet or a Psychonauts where, you know, there's a beginning, a middle, an end that isn't really dependent at all upon collecting things. Um, even Sly, Sly Cooper is somewhat kind of threads the needle in between both, but it feels more like a, a story that you're getting to experience in Sly Cooper where... Astro doesn't have much of a story at all. It's like trying to build a PlayStation 5 is the whole plot of the game. And it... I love PlayStation. I've been with PlayStation since I was three years old. I've owned every single PlayStation. I've played the vast majority of first-party PlayStation games, the vast majority of PlayStation exclusive games in general. And they lean into that so much, and it's really cool to see them respect the history of PlayStation so much. You have, I mean, the most deep cut, and I, I don't want to spoil any of the bots that you collect. I, I know that that shit's been going around on social media. I get so bummed out when I see that pop up on social media where it's like a super deep cut. And I'm like, yeah. well, dang, somebody would have probably... That's the, that's the big allure of the game is that it's, it's wrapped up in just layer and layer of nostalgia. And when you peel it back, it's so rewarding. So have, having that peeled back for you pre before going into the game that just ruins it. Yeah, exactly. But I think that the thing that this game does exceptionally well is similar to what It Takes Two did so well, where each level you're seeing something new, you're getting something new thrown at you, you're experiencing, you know, entirely new mechanics from level to level, and they're rarely reused throughout the entire game. Um, you have like a few that are, are reoccurring, but it's always introducing you something new, something fun. It's so physics dependent. Um, like there's one section that I just thought was so cool where you can like shrink down into this small, small bot and you literally like can crawl under a blanket. And I know that that's so it's like, who the fuck cares? But for me, someone who, you know, I feel like, you you probably feel similarly, Loon. We have seen so much through game mechanics that it's hard to get surprised. Mm. But shrinking yep. down into a little creature and then being able to rummage through this blanket, being underneath the blanket and seeing like you're, as you're moving through the blanket, the blanket above is moving as well. And it's all like in this dynamic uh, it's it's all in this dynamic flow that f it it is really really impressive on a technical level some of the shit they pull off in this game and just the fact that I love okay I'll just say this God of War is in the trailer like so that's that's not a spoiler so there is a God of War level in the game and the fact that there's a God of War level in this game where you throw the Leviathan axe and you can retrieve it as if you were playing Santa Monica's God of War game. And this is going to sound sacrilegious. That level in Astrobot, the God of War level, is better than 90% of the God of War levels in God of War games. <laughs> I knew where he was going with that. It's oh. imp well, and, and let me say this of course, like the God of War. You know, the combat in the God of War games is better than the combat in the Astrobot game. No, no shit. But the fact that it's even close is remarkable. Mm. And what they do with the puzzle solving in Astrobot, 
when you're playing as these, I don't want to go into any of the other characters because I don't know which ones were in the trailer. I know God of War was in the trailer. Mm-hmm. What you do in that in that that uh, God of War level through puzzle solving is remarkable in comparison to what you actually do in the God of War games when you're puzzle solving. Like it shows how fun some of that puzzle solving can be. I know you got to be serious, brr, bro. <laughs> but like, if you just take a step back and try to have fun, it shows how fun that can be. Like just, you know, the, the, even just the throwing of the ax and how fun that can be to solve puzzles, which they do lean into that with a uh, God of War. And sometimes those are fun, but yeah, it incredibly, incredibly well-designed, from a level to level standpoint. And that's the cool thing too, where you're constantly seeing new shit from level to level. It's not like one cohesive, you know, you're not running through one world. You're running through multiple different worlds and they all look different, feel different, have different mechanics. Um, yeah, man, I, I, I really, really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. That's amazing. Where does it rate? <sighs> that's the tough thing. So, <laughs> I think the weakest part of this game to me is the villain lineup. The villains are very, very weak. And I I wish in, I know this is so cheesy. I wish it could have been almost a suicide squad esque, you know, like kill the justice league esque setup where you had some iconic PlayStation villain manipulating, you know, characters that you love. So like you're going up against a snake or an Aloy or a Kratos or a Nate Drake or or whoever, because it getting to play as certain PlayStation characters throughout the game is fun, but I feel like we could have just had those mechanics, you know, like you beat a boss and then you take his mechanics for the Mm -hmm. next level. And and you have like you start building up this mechanical move set for your different characters, and you can like swap between between them at different times and shit like that, or for certain levels where you need one mechanic, you use that for another level. You need the the Leviathan axe for the other one. You need Nate Drake's gun, so you end up using that. Um, but it would have been cool to to see like I don't know, like Sephiroth at the end of the game, and you have to take down Sephiroth using like all the different powers and swapping between them on the fly. And, you know, you could even do something cool where you have like paused, like final fantasy, like you, it, it throws back to the old school final fantasy seven aesthetic. And you, you have the paused battles, like the turn-based battles where you, uh, now I'm going to select Nate Drake's gun because this, this thing popped up and I need to shoot it. And it needs to fall on top of Sephiroth. And you, you know what I'm saying? Like it would have been cool. Oh, to see that would have been, like- that would have been really good. If like the beginning of the game started off, as like a PS1 game. Don't right. know if they are welcome, but go through that as like and showing like how games have evolved. That would have been crazy good. Yeah, I I, I do. I agree, man. Um, should have had Jim Ryan as the final boss. You boot down the door, and there's him with his live service squad. <laughs> yeah, it's him and Concord and Fair Games, and they're all charging at you. We we got this. <laughs> Yeah, man. But in terms of performance on a technical level, I mean, it is, it's, it's awe inspiring. It is, I I mean, literally, it's like a, a sea splitting journey. I'll just say that not to, I won't go any more into why I'm saying that, that specific phrase. But yeah, utilizing this technology to create some of the most memorable moments in terms of the scale, the spectacle, and also being so rock solid in terms of never dipping in performance. I mean, there was one moment, dude, and you have to be so on the nose, so precise to pull this off where there's a mechanic where you can slow down time. And, and this happens multiple times throughout the game. A character throws a knife at you. A villain throws a knife at you. You slow down time. You jump on top of the knife perfectly precise all you know like where where it can't cut you you jump on top of the knife you run up and then you have to like punch the villain in the head or a a villain will throw cards at you you slow it down and this is all you're controlling this entire sequence slow it down jump on top of the cards leap in the air superman punch the villain like they got some cool cool shit on on a a technical level that is mind-boggling in astrobot is this the the studio's first game that isn't VR? Well, they had that pack in game for the okay. PS5, um, but this is just like a much more, 
you know, uh, real, real game. This feels like their first real, real game, in my opinion. Um, I, it's definitely a tier for me. I don't. Uh, <laughs> Is it was, second place to Outlaws? I like Outlaws more. Cool. I do. I do. But but that's the thing about video game criticism on the internet. Yeah. No, it's it's not wrong. If it's what you had fun with, and that's all you know. That's your this your part of your list. And if you enjoyed it more, you know, you shouldn't feel guilt of that. Well, and it's also like you got to hear me out when I say Astrobot is a better game than Star Wars Outlaws. No shit. But I love stories, and the fact that Astrobot has next to no story at all to be found is like. Okay, that's definitely a big knock for someone like me, but for a lot of people out there, they're like, I don't want a fucking story in my platformer. And dude, if that's the case for you, you're not going to find a better platformer out there outside of Mario. You know, it's just, it's not going to happen. So Astrobot, definitely a tier for me. Do you want to move Plucky on to Squire Space would, would tie in. I think Plucky Squire would tie in pretty well, wouldn't it? Of the mechanics that you were talking about, yeah, that is true. Um, and you obviously but, have a bigger list than me, so it'll help thin it down a bit. And then we can right. jump to Space Marine off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Plucky Squire. That's that's a good transition. And I think the first thing I would say about the Plucky Squire is that while astrobot continuously keeps you moving forward the pr the progress in astrobot feels so satisfying cuz you never really feel like you're never going back to do anything unless you just want to go back to a level and and you know get all the collectibles this that and the other but it it's constantly keeping you moving forward and i think mm -hmm. that's the plucky squire's biggest downfall is it really 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 relies on especially as you get further in the game i haven't finished it yet i don't know if i'm going to um but as you get further in the game like there's this storybook element where the storybook opens up and you get a power to like enter different portals and you can manipulate the storybook and and turn the pages and at some point you can even manipulate the storybook to where you are like rotating it so that certain objects in inside of the pages will actually move around and you can kind of control like okay well I need to move this block to the left side so I'm going to rotate the the storybook backwards the block's going to slide around this track and now I'll be able to get to this section that I wasn't previously able to access which is cool the first time you see it <laughs> and the, the more it goes on, the more it's like, oh, man, yeah, okay, we're really doubling and tripling down on this kind of okay mechanic. Um, and to me, the thing that was the biggest bummer that started to become the biggest bummer is it'll be like, okay, well, you got to go find this portal to jump through to retrieve this certain item to bring back to this this page that's eight pages away from where you're at right now. And it'll be the most obscure spot where you find a portal where it has like, it's like, okay, we'll go find it. It's a guy under a tree. So you're going through all the different pages. Like go look for a guy. He's sleeping under a tree. You're going through all the pages, looking for a guy that's sleeping under the tree. You see a bunch of trees on each page, but there's no portal. You keep flipping, keep flipping. And then it's like the beginning opening chapter where you would never think to look at an opening chapter you know, yeah. where it's like chapter four and it's just the artwork. Why would you look there? That's not, you haven't been able to interact with any of those other chapter openings at all. Like you don't get to explore the chapter page. You explore the pages in between. The chapter just opens up the book. And then the, the, the following pages are where you actually explore and interact. But then it's like, okay, randomly now I'm jumping into the opening chapter page finding a guy and it's just, it's not, this is, it's a very, very simple, very easy chill game, but it's just like certain parts are so just, I don't know, like, like weirdly it overstays designed. It's welcome or overutilize it. Yeah. And I, I do, I don't want to make it sound like the game is bad. The game is really good. It's a high quality game. But it, it was jarring coming off of Astro and feeling that constant sense of progression. And then with Plucky Squire, just it, it, it doesn't flow the way it needs to flow. And I don't know how to really explain it because it is 
once again, very simple, like an Astrobot. Like, it's not like you're stuck, but it's just there's yeah. a level of tedium that's not an Astrobot at all. Well, I think you summarized it really well. You said the Astrobot felt like it takes to where you're mm -hmm. constantly moving forward. So there's always progression and it's also introducing mechanics and there's always keeping it fresh. Yeah. Whereas the Plucky Squire seems to be stuck with a little bit, you know, older game design. And that's that's the big difference is when the bar has been set now of like this is what is in, is considered engaging for a platformer to then go back to a more like older style platformer. Well, it, it starts to feel cumbersome. And that's a really good point. Just talking about the platforming in general is the platforming. It's rough, man. The camera positioning often feels off jumping, climbing, just general movement doesn't feel that great at all. And, and I think really the most fun parts of the game, surprising to me are the combat the combat's actually pretty fun. You can get this like spinning, super spinning attack, like a Hulk smash attack. Um, you get the <laughs> Leviathan axe throwing mechanic where you send it off and retrieve it. And, uh, you know, you can power all these things up like the, the combat's actually fun. And I think if they just would have made a, a, a fun storybook game where you go through, explore the storybook pages. And I will say, uh, not a spoiler. Everybody knows the moment where you, you get to be transported to the 3d world is unbelievable. The first time you see it, it is un believable man it's so cool to go from these storybook pages to like a toy story you know little person big world style game it is it, it's remarkable they they because they showed that in the trailer didn't they yeah think of how jaw-dropping that would have been if they kept that under wraps yeah it's such and a tough that would thing have been, and that would have been spread by like word of mouth like some of these indie games that blow up i think that could have done it a favor isn't yeah. it like with Astro Bot being so close to its release, I don't think as many people have been probably trying it out because they've jumped onto Astro instead. So I think that could have given it the edge. Yeah. If I'm being honest. That's not a bad point. And I mean, the fact that... I, I think the fact that when you see it in the trailer, it does create a big pop. Like, people are like, oh my god. And I think that did drum up a lot of buzz for it. But it seemed like that buzz died down pretty quickly. And maybe there would be a little bit more buzz if it was like a big holy shit reveal where people weren't expecting it. They were expecting a storybook game where you're going from page to page and then they're like, oh my God, mm. this is much more elaborate than that. Much more, um, you know, much more complex than that. And also I will say there are kind of those adventure, old school adventure tropes where you're just running around a town doing bullshit ass, like menial, <laughs> very unnecessary, like fill, filler kind of quests go and collect these four pigs and bring them back. It's just, yeah, I will go C tier for the plucky squire, but keep it, you know, with a grain of salt. I haven't finished yet. I still probably got about two hours to go on it. I don't know if I'm going to be returning to it, but for my time so far, I would say C tier for me. That is really unfortunate though. Cause I know how fucking hyped you were for that. Right. Yeah. Like, and it's you were like the biggest advocate for like being like, man, plucky squire, plucky squire. And, and it got like delayed a few times and it was just like, oh, man. yeah. And that's, and that's, that's, I'm glad you actually pointed that out. Cause I was very, very excited for that game. Um, so I guess it, you know, it does go to show you that anticipation doesn't always lead to, and then we were, you and I were just talking about this, uh, off, off recording, um, where we were like, sometimes the anticipation is more exciting than the actual game. And that was definitely the yeah. case for the plucky squire, but not not a bad game at all though. I don't want to make that impression. Um Space Marine 2, man. Oh damn, did I not? Okay, yeah, I put two of us because we both finished Space Marine 2, correct? Yep. Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> I'll let you kick it off because I know this is your shit. Well, straight away, spoiler, that's going straight into the S diff. <laughs> and it's my game of the year. Nice. And it sounds delusional. I I I can guarantee for anybody that's gonna be tuning in and being like, really? That looks so mediocre in some aspects or it doesn't look like it's doing anything new and stuff. But this is the the big thing. Is the I don't want it to sound like elitist. This game is it's made for Warhammer fans. Yeah. That that, that is it. Like everything that they set out to do. They didn't just execute on it, they surpassed it. 
for people who are like me, who know the law and everything, every single thing, the 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 twist at the end, which you probably didn't fully understand. Not at stuff. all. That's something. That's a cliffhanger that's been waiting on from the first game. I waited yeah. thirteen years for that like payoff and stuff like that. And the big thing when you're you're holding the banner and that character makes an appearance, that he's massive in the lore. So seeing him just come out and just completely wipe the floor with people, that was it was just yeah. It's so incredible. The the story was so well done. I'm glad that the people who made World War Z took a took a shot at this. Because the the Tyranid like swarm when they're climbing up the walls and everything, that that suited the game really well. The the combat was really well uh, implemented as well. They've they've polished it up from the first game, and the, the melee combat is so damn good. Like the parrying and stuff, they executed that perfectly. Oh my god, dude, that parry! <laughs> it is. You you followed like Randy Orton, right? You remember Randy Orton and wrestling? It feels yes, it feels like when uh, when one of his opponents will jump up and he times that RKO perfectly. Yeah. It's the closest I've ever got to feeling that sensation in a video game even with timing RKOs in wrestling video games. Like yeah. I can pull off those timed RKOs in the new wrestling games, but it somehow feels more like pulling off a timed RKO when you pull off that perfect parry in Space Marine 2. You, and it's not like it, it's, he doesn't do a RKO. He just rips an enemy in half. <laughs> That'd be so sick. But he just, you know, he rips this enemy in half. But it's it's the aerial aspect. The enemy jumps up in the air. And, and, and the fact that it's as soon as you press that mm. button, that response. And that's because ex- that's what the RKO is. They jump in the air and it feels like as soon as he has a, a middle button he presses and he just snaps into that bitch. Oh, and that's how it feels in, in Space Marine 2, dude. It's sick. No, it is great. And it's so effortless as well. The animations, like they've they've nailed it perfectly. Like he's not struggling. He shouldn't be struggling. He's just he doesn't care. He's ripping them as if they're like you know, sheets of paper almost through these yeah. like enemies and stuff. And so the the main story is fairly fairly short. It doesn't overstay its welcome, but I think that that does it a service more than anything. I think it is the good perfect run length. But something I don't know if you did you test the operations, mode? No. So something that I want to give them a lot of credit for is do you know when you're doing the main story missions and you're all, when you before you board the Thunderhawk ship, you're ordering these people to go do stuff. Yeah. That's who you're doing. That's the operation mission. They're doing what you've told them to do. Oh, so when so... you're doing the, that final mission, when you're all working towards the same objective, that's the operation. You're going to be playing them doing that. Oh, so wow. So that's really immersive that, you know, you, you're ordering them to do this. You actually experience them doing it. So it's, yeah, it's really good. That's awesome. I had no idea about that. So, I mean, I I saw it pop up, but I just thought, I honestly thought that might have been like a multiplayer thing whenever... So you you can play it with bots, but it is obviously more designed with with co-op in mind, just like the main campaign is like, it's heavily oriented for free player co-op. Right. Multiplayer is a a little bit undercooked, so I'll give it a, a bit of a thumbs down for that. It doesn't feel the best Whereas the first game is multiplayer was probably a strong suit more than anything. So that's something that they do need to work on. And yeah, I'm just hoping that it gets support. Like it's blown up immensely. Like they didn't expect it to be as popular and well received as it is, even with people trying to sabotage it. I Certain did. outlets. <laughs> did you see uh, they just received a lot of funding? Hmm? saber interactive and they're they're talking about kotor on the way still so hey i i dude i i'm so so down to see this team because they they are video game ass video game developers you know they they really crank out some gamey ass games and this is a gamey ass game um the jetpack thing the little jump pack 
so fun jumping up. I, you, you and I are kind of in the same camp. You throw a jetpack into anything with us and we're, we're mm. all over it. It's not like the most mechanically advanced jetpack you've ever seen in a video game. It's not, it's no outcast, a new beginning, <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun, man. It's really fun to use that shit and fly up in the air, come down bashing on some. Yeah. yeah that shit's sick. I was really impressed by the day's goniness of this, the hordes, the amount like the first time you see it, I mean, I got killed like three times in that first encounter where you had to go to the, um, you had to like reset something at this machine and the hordes are just coming. I'm like, what the hell do I yeah. do? I'm trying to mow them down. But then I start seeing, oh, no, just throw the grenades, you know, while, while they're trying to climb up, just throw the grenades and you'll pretty much uh, wipe them out. But just seeing some of that, the tech on display with that was really, really impressive. I don't think it's like a visually stunning game. I think environmentally, there are some great, great environmental shots, but like, you know, you're not talking about grade A character models and shit like that, yeah. but I don't think that's what people are really looking for. Well, it, this is the thing, though, as well, is when you put yourself into the shoes of a fan, that is grade A for us. <laughs> from, what we've, from what we've been given right. previously, like, we get scrap. This is the first, like, really big, huge budget game we've ever received. So we're like, man. And that's why, like, I, I was excited for it, hyped for it. And yet I still had that in the back of my mind. There's no way they'll land on this. Right. There's no way they'll knock it out. There's, there's going to be something. It's going to have server issues. It's going gonna, it's gonna to run like crap or something. Like that. This is way too ambitious. And they just, they've nailed it. It's incredible. That's cool, man. Yeah, I, I love hearing that. I, so... I will say I was kind of waiting for that holy shit moment. And I, I, I hate even being negative because you're so damn hyped about it. And I I, I, <laughs> I I really enjoyed the game as well. I'll go ahead. I, I'll For me, it would be a B tier game. And that is to say exactly what you said earlier. This felt like I was out of the loop on a lot of stuff going on. And b But that's the thing. I went in knowing that was a strong likelihood and I didn't care. I was hoping for a cool B tier game. I was worried a C or D tier game would come out of this. This is a great video game. This is a really, really fun game. I was waiting for that holy shit moment where I started to get it or that holy shit moment where I saw something in a boss fight or this other than the crazy tech with the horde encounters, but like individual boss fights, there wasn't really something that stood out to me as like mechanically very, very interesting. It's a lot of the same mechanics over and over. Thankfully, those same mechanics over and over are incredibly fun to repeat. Mm. No, yeah. And like I said, the payoff that you get, it has to be you knowing the thing. That's the thing. So when these characters appeared, you're just like, huh. Exactly. It's just another one of them guys. Yeah. What makes him so special? Whereas to all of us, it's just like jaw drop moment. Like in the first mission when he takes his helmet off, you're like, oh, hi there. So that's where you've been and stuff like that. Like it's just payoff. It's, it's just, yeah, it's for the fans. Well, and it's also like, could they have probably done a little bit better to get new people caught up to speed? Sure. But were they expecting to sell 20 million? No, out? that's what I mean. They, they <laughs> didn't expect that like number of people to be tuning in. They were just like, ah, oh, you know, it'll be all right. You know, right. But it, it had the biggest budget a Warhammer games ever had. But that even then they were like, you know, it's probably just gonna do okay numbers, and it is just yeah, it's ballooned and it's well, incredible. They, they probably had the mindset of like, yeah, well, Space Marine One sold four million copies. If we can get three point five, we'll make our money back, yeah. and then some. But then when twenty, yeah, I, I I would imagine this is gonna be a fifteen plus million copy seller. Yeah, when it's all said and done, this is a smash hit. So it's especially dope. with their roadmap. Like their roadmap before release is so extensive because a big mode that's missing, which was my favorite mode from the first game, was a horde based mode called Exterminators. And they're bringing back that next year. And then there's already, I think it, it dropped today the True Achievements article. With how successful it's been, he, uh, the director wants to make a sequel and he also wants to make a story DLC before doing the sequel. So if he gets all that green there, bring it. But I don't want anybody else touching that series. Other yeah. than them. They love it. They're passionate. It's like when Larian picked up Baldur's Gate. Right. It's just a match made in heaven. Like they're just it's perfect. 
Well, and I mean, dude, they got so much in the works too. Jurassic Park Survival, KOTOR. They got a lot in the, and I know they have multiple teams over there, but that's a, uh, they separated from Embracer at the right time, man. Cause that profit, that Space Marine 2 profit looking pretty, which I'm sure Embracer gets some percentage of that. Cause I'm sure they funded a good deal of it. Cause this had to have been in development under Embracer's umbrella, but mm. I'm not an economist. What the f Don't listen to me about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I will talk about some wild bastards. Mm. So this is the roguelike, um, how to describe this game. It's pretty much a roguelike board game turn. Oh, really? It's weird. It is a lot of weird things. So it's a it's, board game. It's the, it's the sequel to Void Bastards, yes. which was Bioshock inspired roguelike. And, and this is too, it's, this is still a first person shooter, but okay. it's, it all plays out on this board game format where you enter different planets and as you enter these different planets, you uh, hop to, you know, little, uh, little um, environments, little worlds that you're going to visit. And in these worlds, you'll have little tasks like, okay, I'm going to go and rescue the loot here. I'm going to go and rescue this person here. I'm going to go and get an upgrade here. And to get to these different objectives, you have to travel through a um, board game format where you have a certain amount of turns for each of your your characters and so to be like okay it's i have six turns on this first run and it's going to take me 10 turns to get to this upgrade or to get to the guy i need to rescue and then you also have enemies who are on the board game with you as well and they have turns so you might be trying to go and rescue your crewmate and an enemy meets you at a roadblock on their turn like you went up six they went there four and you meet in the middle you know what I mean? And and so you start and then once you meet with these these enemies, that's whenever it turns into a first person shooter. You actually go and get to visit these different environments. And I will say there's quite the reuse of assets, the reuse of environments for you to be traveling from planet to planet and solar system to solar system. And you would think there'd be a lot of variation. There's not. Um, but. The gameplay is just fun. The gameplay is just really fun. The first person shooting is just really good. And there's a surprising amount of strategy involved with the board game mechanics that I was not really expecting where you, you might like want to waste a turn to trigger an enemy away from a certain item. And then you can maybe teleport back to that item or, or like take a different route and you'll bypass the enemy and these tactics at the beginning of the game are like whatever, but throughout the game, they become increasingly useful if you're like, because once again, with the roguelike structure, if you're low on health, yeah. it is what it is, big dog. You still got to get, you still got to, because you, you teleport out of levels. And so it, when you're going into each level, the back of your mind is like, I got to reach that teleportation device to get out of here. I got to warp out of here. And so you see that. And you start planning immediately around that. Okay, that's seven moves away from me. Do I really want to go and encounter this many enemies? Because yeah, there's some treasure over there, but I could probably go and just rescue my companion and get the upgrade in a quicker route than if I if I went and, and had to tackle all these different enemy camps. And it's not, you know, it's not the thing where if you die, you're restarting the entire game. You're you die, you have a, a band of misfits with you and if if one of them dies you just can't use that guy until you warp out of that that solar system and you go on to your new um i guess your, your new planets that you're exploring so okay it's not very rigid it's a tough game it's challenging but it's not like it, it, it you're not losing tons of progress and shit like that you're going forward See, that makes a lot more sense why you've been talking about it so positively then, because you're not the biggest advocate for roguelikes. So I was like, what's going on here? There's got to be something. Right. That would be it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not a I'm not a roguelike guy at all. And it just feels like a, a level by level shooter, a level by level first person shooter. And, uh, you know, like these small little battles that, that take place in their own, you know, their own play space. And. I definitely have some complaints with 
some of the level design. Like it is a bummer to me that you'll see an enemy, you'll be hiding out, ducked out in this little building or whatever, and there will be an open window and the enemy will run by the open window and you could have jumped out the window and been able to blast them in the back. But for whatever reason, you can't like climb out of the window. It's like, mm. you know, just little things like that. It, it can be a bummer. Um, yeah, but it, it, it is, play. it's really good. It's really good. And there's a lot of variety between you don't just have straight up guns. Like you got characters with bow and arrows. You got characters, you got a skeleton dude who just shoots fire out of his finger it's funny as shit. <laughs> you got a little frog who goes and he like uh, lassos people. And I, I should probably mention it's all Western themed. It's like a space Western cowboy adventure that you're going on. Um, mm. Yeah, it, it, it's it's cool. It's a it's silly. The characters are all charming. And you also have to. Uh, you're trying to keep everybody's spirits up throughout the game. So like there's a rivalry system where your own group will start feuding with one another and everything is dependent upon beans in this game. Like you go out and you retrieve beans and everybody loves these damn beans. And if you start sharing beans with people who are beefing, they'll squash the beef and they'll be like, thank you for sharing the beans with me. And they'll become buddies. It's the stupidest shit ever. It's so silly. It doesn't take itself seriously at all. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a fun game, man. It's a really fun game. I, <sighs> ranking it wise was it better than space marine <laughs> that's I, the real question <laughs> you know cuz I, I cuz I did play I played did you play void bastards I didn't one? actually I did feel it a little bit undercooked but you, you sound like there's been good improvements being made it had it had charm but it was very even for me being a roguelike fan I felt like it was like I said, underbaked. And it was very repetitive, very quickly. I, I so I think the way that they, it is repetitive. It, it the game overstays its welcome. It took me about fifteen hours to finish. It probably should have ended in about seven. I think what they do with like the mods and some of the upgrades you get, where like you'll have to choose who do i give this faster reload to who do i equip with no fall damage once again you get a jetpack and that's some of the sickest shit ever flying over enemies and then like slowing down just blasting someone if you got you a dual wielding uh character and shit and that you all the characters play so differently and have different weapons a sniper you know for your long range you got uh gatling guns you got your dual wielding six shooters you got like I said, the guy with the lasso and, and you got so many different ways of playing with different characters who are all controlled differently. Um, but yeah, some of the lack of like real environmental interactivity, some of the repetitive, like, Oh my God, I've seen the same level a hundred times at this point. Yeah. It, it, it knocks it back a little bit. It's still really fun. I think I would put it below space Marine too, but both really, really fun games. Um, I just think I enjoyed mechanically Space Marine 2 a little bit more. But I think the the depth of Wild Bastards, I, I appreciated that. Like, there's a lot. And there's so much that I, you know, just totally forgot to mention here. That game has a lot of systems, a lot of depth to it. Hmm. That's your. This will be your second roguelike of the year, right? Oh, I have no idea. What would, What was the first one? Bellatro. Oh, yeah, 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 Bellatro. And, you know, that's the thing where both of these games, like, they're so different from the typical roguelike to me that I think it was why I was able to get into them. Usually similar with Souls-like, roguelike, I'm just... And, and Wild Bastards got a physical release. Forgot to mention that. That was a big reason I picked it up. I was like, I, I'm, I love supporting AA and indie teams who are still committed to the physical format. Yeah, All absolutely. Right. I've been running my, running my jaw <laughs> for a while now, Loon. Give me some relief. What you want to talk about? I'll knock Lords of the Fallen out. Mentioned it many, many times. Um, this is me putting it here because it's been 100%. So that's the, the book completely closed on it. And yeah, it's it's really good. The, the, the improvements they made over time is what made me go back and give it another shot. It's nice when a developer has an idea 
and they go to execute on it, they wobble a little bit. And then the community that sticks by them gives them feedback. And then instead of throwing that feedback back at their face, they instead embrace it. And that's the big thing. Well, I have a lot of respect for them because they had a, they had a discord channel and people were asking them like, what they basically threw out questions. Like, what would you want to see then? And people were just throwing crazy things out like, ah, in-game modifiers, like randomizers, like, you see this on Souls in Dark Souls One. This is a mod. You never see like FromSoft implement that into the actual proper game. So like you know, we'll ask if they can do this. Is it achievable? Probably not. And they were like, "Hell yeah, it's achievable!" And they took a crack at it and stuff. And yeah, it's really really good. the The biggest drawback of the game is that it's one of the first to obviously be a full fledged I think Unreal Engine Five game. So it runs like ass. Yeah. And it also doesn't help the fact that not only is it the first, you were way too ambitious by having two worlds needing to be loaded simultaneously and just having it toggleable. Because it's not like a loading, like it's instant. You hold down a trigger and click X and you're in the other world and it completely changes the environment and stuff. So it really does impact. There were, because I co opted it for the final set of achievements and stuff to help like blitz through it quicker we got to that final third of the game and there was like a 20 minute period where it's like five frames it was it was brutal which you don't experience in single player this is the thing Uh... and it's co-op it's co-op mechanic is so so strong that that's a major drawback because it does something incredible where you can you can start your character I can start my character. You do that opening five-minute tutorial. You summon me. That's it. We could we could sit there play through the entire game all night. You don't need to resummon me. We die. We just go back to the checkpoint. That's something Dark Souls and Elden Ring doesn't get right at all. There's barriers that get set up in Elden Ring, so you have to desummon. If you die. And I've summoned you. I have to resummon you again, so I have to go back to a checkpoint. It's just very, it just wastes your time. Whereas the, here, the these mechanics work really well. So, yeah, I I don't. Do you feel like UE five has been kind of a disappointment so far? Like, how many games we, run on UE five that are just marvelous? Like, Immortals of Avium ran really well. Um, the <laughs> The both first person games, now that I think about it though, Immortals of Avium and Walking Sim Horror, da, 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 uh, Layers of Fear, the remake of that that came out last year ran really, really well, really, really impressive. But I feel like it's few and far between. Of you see a lot of examples of UE5 kind of being super, super rough on a, on a mm. performance level, yeah. Um, it might be just that thing of where you've been so used to making things for the previous engine and not understanding the limitations just yet. Because no. you it's the thing where, you know this is the big the big thing with technology. You think back to the PS3 and how games ran like crap in the opening years, but you look at the last of us in its final year of release. Right. Like it's the same it's the same hardware you just know how to use utilize it a lot more efficiently and because we're so early in the generation and they've not really tinkered all that much with it it's you know you have titles like this which suffer performance wise but um it's gonna be a c for me c it's it's like when i look on that list and seeing that you play space marine at b i think i'd have to keep it at c well no i mean it's it's your ranking it's got yeah, uh, it's it's the thing is like I love a lot of the aspects, but a lot of the things that it should be getting right, it doesn't get right, and it doesn't feel as satisfying. The bosses that you fight in Lords of the Fallen for a Souls like that's the backbone of the game. So the the bosses were very very underwhelming. They weren't challenging at all. Like there's for the hundred percent, I had to beat the game without using checkpoints and never dying and i had warped healing so my healing didn't even work and i was able to just get through that within like four hours 
Good God. <laughs> that, 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 that's pretty damn impressive, dude. So, considering that was like a no breaking sweat, really, yeah, it's, it gets knocked down a bit. Um, all right, I guess I'll move on to Pyre here. First time ever playing it, and the only reason I played it, I was I've been going back and watching Giant Bomb, their old game of the year discussions, and uh, I, I think it was 2016, and somebody like described this as a basketball game. And I was like, what? And so I looked up gameplay. I was like, yo, this is a basketball game. I, I just thought it was, you know, a roguelike something, something or another. Like, ah, yeah. and, and so I bought it super cheap and dove into it. It's a three on three basketball game. Like a straight up basketball, except you're in purgatory and you're trying to fight for your freedom to get out of purgatory. And you are playing basketball because the gods or the entity that is granting you the ability of, of freeing yourself for some reason it's in a tournament style fashion where you play this game of orb basketball. <laughs> sure. You're slamming these orbs into the under realms and then jumping over enemies and dunking on people. And it's so silly, so fun. Um, and it's also not just like, there's a real story here, which is so <laughs> shocking. Cause it's all like text-based, but they or well, there there's narration, but all of like the encounters between you and your other party members and stuff are text based, and it's still so it still hits on such an emotional level, like because so what ends up happening is you play these three on three games, and whenever you make it to the finals, and there's multiple or whenever you make it, I should say to. Uh, I guess, yeah, the finals. We'll call it the finals. But there's multiple finals that you'll reach throughout this game. And each time you win your finals matchup, you send one of your teammates to freedom, back to Earth. And they they get to go back to their family. And so everybody is wanting to go back to the life that they knew. They don't want to be trapped in purgatory. So you're having to pick out of your crew who to send back to freedom. So that's really fucking tough. And you'll have people coming to you and saying like, yeah, you know, I need to go back and take care of my mom. I need to go back and take care of my kids. And like, there's all of these really emotional pitches, but I'm going to try not to fucking tear up because I broke down during this moment when I was playing the game. I could not believe I, I sobbed like a baby. There's a character who says something to the effect of, um, like, because it's kind of coming around to where it would be their turn to be sent up to freedom. And they say something to the effect of like, they don't have nobody back home and that they would rather be trapped in purgatory with us because mm -hmm. we are the only people that actually care about them. And it's like, Oh my God. And they gamify your emotions to such a, fucked up degree because that character kind of sucks at the game of, of yeah. basketball yeah and so you're like yeah. because there, that becomes the thing too where it's like okay i'm sending people to freedom sure but they're based... good they're good they're really good characters right right well and it's also yeah. the thing where i'm sending you to freedom but you know sometimes yeah you made a really good pitch for why you should go to freedom but you're a hoop so you're staying in purgatory mm. with me, bitch. <laughs> We're going to go with the finals together. Whatever is whatever. I don't care about your pitch. And, but then, you know, that character, it was like one of those characters I, I didn't use a ton. And it gets down to the wire and I got hoopers with me and I got to cut somebody. It's like, I'm sorry, homie, but. These these send are, him that, send him to nobody. They had to go. <laughs> they had to go. We got hoopers, and we're not losing this shit. The game's hard. That's the mm. thing. It's like the shit is not easy. And I was just playing on like the standard difficulty. Like it's not easy. And so like I don't want to you know cut you, but I'm losing sometimes out here. I don't want to lose. And so I ended up, I ended up making a play with my head and not my heart. And I still feel guilty about it, but hopefully they're doing all right, all right out there in the, the earthly realms. But 
Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and go on and on about it. Game came out in 2016. I'm sure you guys have already heard a good deal about Pyre. I will throw this in the S tier. This is one of the best games I've ever played in my life from a mechanical level. Um, it's unbelievable that a sports game like this exists that disguises itself so well as, you know, just it. it you, you could play this game as a sports fan, you could play this game as a narrative fan. You could play this game as a, a fan of just systems driven, mechanics driven, dynamic encounter based gameplay situations. You can play this game from so many angles and enjoy it. Like it's just not a game I could really, I don't see many faults in it. Sure. Would it be great to have a cutscene or two here and there? Fine. Would it be great to have dialogue? Fine. But like, I'm not going to knock that for a team working on a budget that they're working on. I was about to say, you place yourself in their shoes back in 2016, this released. So you're talking like a few years before that of development. It's a super... Super giant. Super giant, yeah. right? So this is like Hades and stuff. Like they didn't hit them production qualities till Hades. Yep, 20 because of the Because of these games that they knocked out of the park again and again and again. So, it's yeah, it's crazy. I think it's also why people are mildly disappointed that we're getting a Hades sequel because yeah. every game before, like they didn't make sequels. All their games were completely unique. So it's going, it's gonna, it may rob you of like a pyre in the future because they're going to be like, ah, oh, Hades two, Hades three, because it's successful and stuff like that. Yeah. This kind of innovation and uniqueness is slowly being lost over time i agree man and like there's just shit in this like when the enemies are or whenever the other team there's certain like everybody plays differently as well and everybody once again has their own upgrades and then you know you can practice and you can strategize and you can equip different abilities and buy things from the shop and they all have impact in the game and but you'll go up against opponents who like they have flying abilities so you'll have opponents who are just literally off the ground so you're at such a disadvantage and then you end up learning oh i gotta just like lunge into you and whatever happens happens but like it's the only way of getting the ball from because it's like rugby like you're trying to rip the ball away from people just <laughs> tackling motherfuckers smashing people you got long range shots that you're pulling off trying to you know and if you hit them the ball will go flying and you can go and grab it and get on a fast break pull off a dunk but like those flying enemies you lunge at them in the air and if you miss they're dunking like they're gonna score if you miss so it's such high risk high rewards high stakes action non-stop and it, there's not a moment of the actual playing of this game where it's not like tense palm sweaty uh just really god damn it's good man really good um yeah s tier pirate it's, you wanna... it's always good when we stumble upon a game that really so many years ago and the, it's not only that you stumble upon it, like you may have probably heard Pyre in passing conversation, but of you never course. paid any attention. And then you're just like, how did I miss this? Right. Like it's crazy. Well, and it's it's the thing where it, it all it takes is one person to describe a game one way where it opens you up to a different perspective where it's like, I hear basketball and I'm such a humongous basketball fan that I'm like, oh, I did not know that it was anything like basketball. And then you look at it deeper and you're like, wait, you're passing the ball. You're, that's the hoop. I thought, I don't, why is the hoop on the ground? But then you start, okay, I get it. And yeah. S tier for Pyre. You want to talk about some old Punch Club or some Wolo? Yeah, we'll go Punch Club. It kind of links into like you talking about skills and stuff. Very skill point and skill driven game. Um, I'd, I'd heard it was uh, like a fairly mixed game a lot of people they like the concept of it but felt that it was very very punishing i don't know if you felt the same way when you was playing it i played the second one the one that came out last year so uh, so that's the thing they they changed the game design from the feedback of the first game in uh... the first game your your skills and stats deteriorate every single day so you have to train you're constantly training because You'll do like push ups and get strength to eight, for instance. Yeah. You'll go to sleep and then you'll lose one level of strength. So it's constantly a grind and stuff. And there's kind of like a, 
there's a wall that you need to break through because there's certain skills when you do unlock them, they then lock your stats in so that they can't drop below five and then they can't drop below nine and stuff. So it kind of eases the grind. But that opening, I'd say like two hours, is very, very, very slow. Yeah. And you're doing the stuff and you're like, man, this is it's what I bounced off the first time. And then I stumbled on somebody doing a video on it the other month. And I was like, oh, I'll give it a go. And I'm much, much, much further in this time. And I, I am enjoying it. I I wish there was a little bit more control over what you could do. As In the second game, is it still like auto-battling and stuff? Like you, you select your loadout and then you just let him do his thing? Yeah, I believe so. I, I only played like maybe four or five hours of it, but yeah. Yeah. And there's, it's very strange because they, they make it seem like the stat numbers are really, really important when they're not mm. as important. It's the skills themselves that you get. So you need to get to nine strengths so that you can get a nine strength skill, which is important and stuff like that. And it's, it takes so long to accumulate them skill points because you'll get to nine strength. It's constantly deteriorating each day. So you need to keep that strength up while winning matches against people that you might struggle against which you need that you needed that skill point to be able to beat them and then you get if you get beat by them you get injured which means it makes training harder because you'll have like a broken arm and stuff and it's it just doesn't feel like it respects your time it's a very 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 grindy game that first one so i'm hoping they fix things with the second but um once you break through like i said that wall it makes it a little bit more bearable I think I'm close to finishing it. I'm maybe in like there's like little story segment things that it shows you like a graph that you're ticking off and I think I've got like one or two left to do. Nice. But um I'd probably put it in C. Okay. I'm hoping I'm hoping that the second game improves on on the flow and stuff cuz I I believe you don't get deteriorating stats. I don't, Which is like a big, a big thing. I, I my memory's awful with it, but I don't think so. At least not to. It, it was. It, it never felt like I was being punished to some crazy mm. degree. Um, it just kind of got a little bit repetitive to me, and I was like, all right, cool. And imagine, right. yeah, it, then the first one's repetitive. Imagine losing stats, making right. it even more repetitive. It's like, dude, I just spent the whole game, a whole day training on the treadmill, and now I've got to do that again because I've lost half of the progress that I made yesterday. It's just crazy. So I guess I'll uh, talk some Quidditch, some Harry Potter Quidditch. Um, I guess going from Pyre sports game to another kind of outlandish out there sports game. Enjoyed this one a good deal as well. I didn't end up finishing it. I played probably five, six hours of it. I thought it was pretty solid. It's like magical basketball um, with, once again, rugby influence, mm. but also yeah. riding a broomstick and... Uh, yeah, it, you're trying to score 100 points and whoever gets to 100 wins first. And then there's like the little snitch thing where it's this little fellow who appears and he leaves behind like some gold dust trail and you got to go sniff that out. And if you capture him, I think you get like 30 points um, or is it 50 or 30? I think it's 30. Um, really? Usually I thought it was you won the game. The I movies. don't. Because that was the big thing. They were losing and then he catches it in his mouth. Well, you know what? Swallows it. So it starts off where you um you only get the first two difficulty levels and you have to unlock the later difficulty levels. So it might be that once you because I'm on the difficulty level right before the final one. So it might be when you get to the final one, if you do catch the snitch, you win. Like and it makes it even more challenging but in the first three difficulty levels i don't think it's that uh, i know it's not that for the the first two and i'm pretty sure in the third it's not either but i could be wrong on that um yeah but you know he pops up a couple times a game you gotta follow him and, and try to grab him i kind of hate that element the snitch is the one thing one part of the game where I, it just feels like it takes me out where yeah. i'll be winning you know by a pretty drastic margin and then they'll grab 30 quick points. I'm like, what well, damn. And then it, it makes me engage with a part of the game that I don't really want to engage with. I just wish the actual quidditch was harder 
and that the snitch wasn't in it. Like I wish I could go to some some setting and take the snitch out yeah. and just make the actual game harder. Because the game, I mean, you you are winning a hundred to nothing, like very very regularly. It's it, it kind of gets boring. And then when you get up to that third difficulty level, it's much more challenging. But I'll be winning, you know, fifty sixty to nothing, and then they'll grab the snitch twice in a game, and it's like, all right, I guess I really got to factor in this little fucker now. <laughs> Yeah, no, you are right as well. I, it's 150 for the thing. I thought you just automatically won it, but no. Oh, okay. It gives you 150 points and stuff. It's that thing where, um, obviously, it's a made-up sport. Yeah. That that kind of thing fits perfectly when you're trying to tell a story. So that was the whole thing, is that obviously they're losing. It's his first time and stuff, being called up to the team, and then he does that, and it kind of makes him, you know, the special kid, Harry Potter winning them the match and stuff but in like when you think about it, it's why i've always i wasn't excited upon hearing it because it didn't sound like a very particularly enjoyable game it seems like something that makes sense in the universe but wouldn't translate well into a game for a fun factor because like you said it's either going to be way too easy because there's so many factors they have to consider so you're going to be ball stomping the the opposition, or it's going to be there's so much juggling, and you're just like, oh my God, what? How are you meant to win this? Right. Kind of well, and it's also the thing too where you're correct about the game part of it lacking. There's a career mode, but there's not a lot of interesting shit taking place inside of the career mode. There, there's not really a story. There's characters that pop up here and there, and they have like once again these sort of visual novel aspects and then a little mild preamble before a match but comparing it to something like pyre it's like pyre's got a full in-depth weighty emotional story and it's also got the sports element of it um and i also think pyre does the sports element a whole hell of a lot better um and and there's real camera issues that'll pop up when you first start playing this game it, it takes a second to be like oh my god this camera is just spinning all over the place and then you understand okay it's doing that for me i don't even need to really touch the camera just let it transition the camera for me because it's doing what it needs to do to focus me in the right direction and i don't need to think about trying to auto or manually focus it myself um until you have full control over the character and then definitely do it. But transitioning from character to character can be a bit of a, a bit of a pain when you first start, but it's a, it's a solid game. I would throw it in the C tier. It's, it's definitely not a, a B tier game for me, but I'd put it above. Um, Actually, no, I'd put it below Plucky Squire, but yeah, solid C tier game, fun, both uh, PlayStation plus games as well. So if you're on the extra tier, you can access both of those titles. I will go ahead and hit Marvel versus Capcom really, really quick, and then we'll both burn through our last two. Mm -hmm. So I played played a ton of this shit. I played the shit out of Marvel uh, versus Capcom, the fighting collection. I guess I'm a fighting game guy now. Like I'm not good at them, <laughs> yeah. but I, I guess no, you're, I just... you're like me. It's it's fun when you're. I would never play them competitively online, no. so I'd get absolutely wiped the floor. <laughs> but when yeah. I'm in my own little bubble. And I'm enjoying Mortal Kombat and I'm just button mashing and people are getting hit. And then I get rewarded with a little story cutscene segment after that. Like it is. It's, I enjoy them. They're, they're go it's like a cheesy, cheesy action movie yeah. kind of experience. That is the one bummer with this. None of these have like real stories or anything. They have like endings and different characters will have different endings and stuff like that for some of the games. Um, I played through almost every game in the collection. Uh, it, it is, I should, it's not like so... They take about an hour. You have unlimited continues. So it's it's not like the old arcade days where you die, you got to pop a quarterback in that bitch. Like you, you can keep continuing. So I would lose quite a bit. And then I would just continue until I found some spammy ass move that I could pull off like <laughs> Storm or Wolverine where I'm diving, like I'm doing my my circular spins into the character, my, my whirlwind attacks. Um or just different crazy attacks with Storm or Cyclops or whoever, uh, or Hulk. I used the Hulk a good bit. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would just kind of spam my way through it. I'm not going to lie about that. I'm definitely not good at these games. But I played through the Punisher. I played through every X-Men game in the collection. I played through Marvel vs. Capcom. Uh, was it two? I played through one of the... I played through a lot of them. I played through a good deal of them. I played through one of the, I think Street Fighter versus X-Men. I think that's one that's on there. Uh, 
Marvel versus Street Fighter is that one? I, I I played through a good deal of these bitches because uh, I I know that they they give you the trophies for each game that you finish, and I got almost all of them, but I didn't get the final trophy for completing every game. So I know I haven't finished all of them, but I got pretty much every single individual one. How many? That that sounds like there's a load of them in that title. How many? Like roughly, are there? Is there more than like ten? I think it's somewhere around like seven to ten ish, somewhere in that range. Didn't even um, know that there were that many of them. It's crazy. Yeah, and they kind of blend together because they all do, or not they all, but a lot of them share a very similar art style and stuff. So at times I would think, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure which game of these I'm playing because once again, you're not talking about a real story or anything with most of them. Um, and there are very drastic mechanical differences where you'll have, you know, partner characters for like the uh, Marvel versus Capcom, the think marvel versus capcom 2 where you include like partner characters into the mix and there's a bunch of different attacks that you have to learn for that compared to like a um i think children of the atom is just straight up x-men children of the atom i think that's just straight up a one-on-one -on -one. and i could be once again a lot of these do blend together in my head so i could be getting some of the terminology wrong here some of the facts some of the info incorrect but yeah, the Punisher beat em up game is really, really damn fun as well. Uh, cheesy little story thrown in there. Really fun mechanics, though. And uh, I just think the art style is incredible on pretty much all of these games. And I think that as we're seeing budgets balloon, looking back to this and kind of thinking about maybe we could pull off an X-Men RPG with this art style, you know, an X-Men 97 approach to an RPG. Why, why spend $300 million and do facial animation and all that shit? Like, let's get creative and... Um, yeah, I don't know, but really enjoyed it. I, I can't, it's almost hard for me. I'll, I'll throw it in the B tier, but understand that that means nothing coming from me because I, I couldn't tell you a single intricate <laughs> detail about fighting games. I just enjoy playing them while I'm listening to a podcast. Same thing with Quidditch. No, yeah. no, that's good. It's good that the, the collection landed. I think it skipped Xbox, which was kind of yeah. unfortunate. I think um, it's supposed to be coming to Xbox at some yeah, point soon. I, they, they struck a thing where they was like, okay, we'll help you get it. Like over the line and stuff. If it's yeah. if you're struggling, but um, it's great to see these types of collections be given like a second life, and not like it's so good that they bundle them all together instead of individually selling them and then dragging them out. Because they've done it with like Castlevania and stuff and Contra. It's nice to just have a bunch of them bunch and then given to the player. Yeah, it's great preservation. Yo, Capcom. Resident Evil Collection, where are we at? The classics, bring them to <laughs> modern platforms. But yeah, fun game, man. Fun, fun game. Hit me with some Wo Long. What you, what you, what's your thoughts on the Wo Long? So I did the uh, the hundred percent and Lords of the Fallen, and then moved on to Mirage. And very rarely does this happen. I had another itch just to go back to another Souls like, and I was looking around and stuff, and me and a friend were talking about went into like a deep discussion about why he feels Elden Ring isn't as good as people say. Hmm. He has his own critiques and stuff. And a lot of it is they have made the bosses in modern souls likes faster and faster, but you, the character, aren't as fast. So they're outpacing you with movements and stuff, and it feels like We've we've come further and further of instead of it being like a dueling thing, you're waiting so long for an opening to get one hit in, and then you have to wait forty seconds and stuff for a, for an opening and stuff. Whereas Wo Long, you're not waiting. If you're waiting, you're getting hit. It's constantly. You can deflect any attack. It doesn't matter what it is. A fireball. A fire on the floor, lightning, anything. Like it's just constant, constant flowing movement, and its stamina system is constantly going like this. Instead of a bar that just drains, you're eating into it if you're if you're not playing well, or you're improving it because you're hitting and you're landing and you're you've got a really good flow going. And that's what I mean. Like you get into some of these fights, and there's there's no downtime. Like some of these fights you're going in and it's just constant back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There's no sitting there waiting with a shield 
there's no slowdown. It's amazing. It's really, really good. That, so I didn't know that. I didn't know that it was that pace. I didn't know it was that fast. That that makes me much more interested because that's the big thing I hate about Souls games is the speed, man. They're so methodical. I think what they should have done is because it opens up as like a normal Souls like where it gives you an opening very tiny section, like maybe 15 minutes of fighting normal enemies. And I think the reason why people struggled so badly is because you don't have to really engage with the mechanics. You can be just very, I'm just going to hit and do whatever I want and block, and it's just, I'm not getting punished. And then you go into that first boss, and it's like, you don't engage with these mechanics, he's going to kick your ass yeah. with dust. And it's one of the very, I think he, he's either, there's only one or two maybe, he's one of the very few bosses that has a second phase. So it is a, it is a big difficulty curve. Where it's like you learn the mechanics or you're not beating him. Yeah. So I think it would have probably served the game better if they would have just started off with that to kind of ingrain it into players' heads instead of allowing them uh, a build up section of getting bad habits into the combat and then having to unlearn them bad habits and stuff. But for yeah. me, it's A, a tier game. It's A tier? Yeah. I'm nice. two missions away from finishing it. But my god. And the 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 rarity we see of Chinese based games. Like it's always usually Japanese history yeah. and stuff. This is Free Kingdoms China. And seeing like characters like Lu Bu and stuff, it was really cool. And they do him so well in this game. Like when you meet him, it's it's incredible. I um because I know that it, is it still on Game Pass? Yeah, that's why he's playing it. Okay, he doesn't own it. Nice. Yeah, I, I might have to check that out. It's, I, I probably won't. I, I I'm so <laughs> I'm so anti Souls. There's at this no point. there's no pausing. Nah. I don't believe you can't so. pause. I don't think so. Jesus, man, that's that's the death nail for me. Where I'm, I can't do it. If I can't pause, I can't do it. Yeah. Um, to rip that band aid off immediately, <laughs> yeah, right. No chance. Um, casting a Frank Stone, Supermassive's next game. I didn't want to buy this $39.99 for the digital, no physical edition, really didn't want to support it. But I kind of worry about Supermassive, man. It seems they're getting stretched really thin. Have you noticed that? Like Little Nightmares 3, why did they take that? Casting a Frank Stone, working with Dead by Daylight. Why did they take that? They got the that, dark pictures. That in itself. Why a Dead by Daylight like adaptation into a single? That just doesn't. Is it good? Do they land with it? That's my biggest like yeah. question mark because it's the kind of thing where it's like it doesn't seem on paper something that you would pursue. Like the whole allure of Dead by Daylight. And that as as a concept is that you're pulling from every horror franchise and you're just placing them into one little playground. Yeah, it's a good game. It's a good story. It's fun. It's it's super massive that you know. You know, it's the same style of game that they've been putting out for uh, since 2015 with Until Dawn, a decade almost at this point. You know, they they make massive uh or they make minor iterations to their games with each release. Um. But this is one where I was just like, let me, I'm going to buy this thing because you saw with Telltale, you know, we start getting Batman and we start getting Guardians and we start getting Tales from the Borderlands and we start, it became a lot. And that's, that studio started getting stretched really thin and yeah, it ends up becoming pretty obvious that something's not right. And I'm starting to kind of get that feeling with Supermassive. I hope I'm wrong. So I wanted to support it and I enjoy it. It's a game that takes place in between three different timelines. So it's like it starts off in the, I think the fifties or sixties and sixties, and then it goes into the early eighties and then it goes to a modern day timeline. Um, and all of these timelines are linked together, but not. So, you know how often in a game or movie, whatever television show, they will try to linger in one timeline just to give it 
equal screen time as like the other plots that are going on because it wants to make everything feel like, well, these characters from back here are just as important as these characters now. And these characters in the middle are just as important as these characters from back then. It doesn't really do that. It's like, we're going to tell the story that's most compelling and we'll just flash back or flash forward when we need to. Really, the 80s story is the the core story of this game because that's where the film takes place. It's this crew of, um, you know, young upstart wannabe filmmakers and they want to create their own horror film. I won't go into it much more than that, but they go in to create a horror film where a murder took place. Of course, that's probably not the best idea. Shit goes wrong. You get it. But... So the the core game is that 80s plot line. The modern plot line is revolving around um the modern plot line is revolving around the film that was made by the the people in the 80s. I'll just say that. The 60s plot line is in and out of your hair really quickly, but it's more important than almost any other plot line, but that's the point. They knew we can tie Everything that happened in this 10, 20 minute window, it can still be the driving force for the rest of the game without us having to linger here. We don't got to go and see the cops back, you know, the backstory to his life and him sipping coffee, drinking the newspaper, talking to his wife and hearing about the marriage issues. And like, who gives a fuck? Get to what we need cuts, to see. Yeah, cuts all the fat and just get yeah. straight to the story. Get to the story we need to understand for each individual uh, timeline and they do a great job of that and i think that in terms of atmosphere and lighting this is the best supermassive has ever done by a wide margin i you never look at supermassive games as like show pieces other than until dawn it they don't look that great they're just fun horror adventure games this is a great looking game from an environmental standpoint. Character models can still be wonky at times, but at times it's like unbelievably photorealistic, which is kind of always their issue. But the the lighting is so, so good in this game, and it adds a next level d- degree of atmosphere, um, which is huge for horror games. And I, I've never really felt that they've nailed the atmosphere quite like they do in this game. However, dialogue... Mm. boy it can be rough it can be really rough at times you'll have like a dead body appear and then they'll get super like quippy right after and it's like Mm. it kind of implies that this is the first dead body a person has seen that that you know you're controlling but then they have a quip after it's like dude imagine if you saw a dead body like i've i don't i don't think i've ever seen a dead body in my life i don't think but like if i did i would freak the fuck out like, even if it was just like, I'm trying to think of maybe I've seen a, you know, walking around New Orleans, seen someone OD or some shit. Uh, like, I don't think I've ever seen that. But if I saw that, I would freak the fuck out. It dehumanizes them and doesn't, it doesn't feel right when yeah. you have that. It's it. I get that. Because the way they, they formulate their games, they really try to mimic movies. And in movies, you see that happen a lot but when you're actually in a your your immersion is linked so much more than a movie yeah you're controlling these characters so when you yourself are trying to put yourself in them shoes and you in your brain have a reaction and that doesn't link with theirs and they're doing that it completely disjoints it and you're like why would you say that exactly and then because you're thinking about that that's ruining that story moment and it just it starts to unravel from there totally and I will say where the story, because I, I got about an hour left to go on it. Not to spoil anything, but it's it's a bit off the rails. It starts going a bit off the rails. And it, it's a really cool grounded story up to the point where it gets a bit silly, um, which is what it is. If I want to wanna... ask a little bit more after because that's my biggest okay. complaint and I don't want to like ask the question and then have that be the big spoiler because right. that's my biggest complaint with these games. Yeah. Mhm. It ah uh, okay, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. I think I know the exact game you're talking about. Are you talking about mm-hmm. a Dark Pictures game? Yeah. Okay, I know exactly the one you're talking about. You're talking about the War game. Okay, yeah. Similar. <laughs> Similar. <laughs> We won't go any more into it. Yeah. Okay. It. Okay. 
may I'll even put a little spoiler, just just light brief spoiler uh, for anybody who's played that game who hasn't played Frank Stone. But anyways, um, I'll throw it in. I'm going to throw it in B tier. I'm not going to put it on the same tier as Plucky Squire and Quidditch because I I'm going to finish the casting of Frank Stone. And yeah, is that because it's only five hours? Sure. That's probably a big reason why I'm going to finish it. But another reason is because I think that they just consistently tell fun stories. Sure. It's not perfect. Sure. The voice acting isn't always great. Sure. The writing always isn't perfect, but they're fun horror stories. And I think something about the campiness and silliness of horror is appealing to me. Um, I, because I'm not somebody who's freaking the fuck out from any horror related, anything movies actually scare me more than video games, but I really don't get scared of horror video games. I've been playing horror video games since I was three, you know? So it's like, I, I'm so desensitized to this at this point, but, um, yeah, I'm going to throw it in the B tier. I, I really, I I'm enjoying Frank stone, the casting of Frank stone a lot. And I, I just hope that hope my, my homies over there at super massive are okay. I don't know any of those people. They're not my actual homies, but I feel like we're we're homies at this point. I bought all their damn games. I enjoy all their <laughs> damn games. I want to continue seeing them make games. So that's that's a good point. You've obviously played all of them. How does this stack up? Like obviously, a lot of people, you know, Until Dawn is is their best piece. A lot of people consider. I'll give you this: Until Dawn one, Corey two, uh, casting of Frank Stone three. It's not as good as the the their standalone stuff is far better than the dark picture stuff. The dark picture shit's always rushed, always janky. This is mm. janky. This is a little bit janky too. Like I appreciate that you can explore and stuff and control the characters, but man, that camera will just zoom up those characters' ass like nobody's ever seen. Boy, you can. I mean, it is right on their back. They're like, yo, zoom out a little bit. What are you doing? I can't. Like I, I'm not getting any atmosphere, any tension, any anything because I'm just seeing your neck. I see the damn hair follicles on your neck, dude. Zoom <laughs> back a little bit. And then sometimes it'll just w- totally go off the rails where a character will just like start juking and jiving, kind of spazzing out like they're having a damn seizure for a second. It's, what are you doing? And it's only that only happens when you're controlling the characters. I don't weird shit, but still a fun game. I'm going to throw it in the B tier. Dude, that, that is a staircase tier list. Wow. <laughs> that is a. This- Bop, bop, bop. <laughs> that it, that's very visu- visually uh visually pleasing. I dig it. <laughs> Two, three, four, five. Well, Loon, that is the ranking this month. Next month we shall be coming back to you with another stacked ranking because oh boy, next month. Are you getting metaphor? I, I want to. I'm still like a little bit. It's the thing, like I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic because Souls, ha- Soul Hackers Two was was very subpar, and I'm, I'm just like, I hope you guys can make something because I, I love Persona, of course, but it would be nice to see you guys doing something else. Totally, It'd be awesome. That's so like one of the I reasons I think will... I'm gonna buy it. Mm. Yeah, I think I'm gonna so buy it. Just cause... Veil Guard as well as late in the month. We're gonna miss out on it aren't we? in our discussion. So it'll yeah. Be... In November. I mean, I guess we could. Give us plenty of time. We could. Yeah, I, I would honestly rather not rush it and rather just wait until the end of November to do it because, I mean, I think you and I are both going to, well, I, I imagine we're both going to, if not finish it, get close to finishing it by the end of November. Mm, absolutely. So, yeah, dude, excited. Silent Hill 2. Speaking of Supermassive, Until Dawn, the remake's coming out in October. I really don't know what the fuck to do because morally I don't want to support these cash grabby ass remakes, but I want to see more until dawn. Cause I fucking love that first game. And there's actually cool ways of expanding it that I thought about where you don't have to necessarily involve those. Yeah. We'll get into that at a different time guys. Appreciate you for tuning in. It's already been a nice fucking almost two hour ramble. So uh, we shall see you good people very soon. Hope y'all are doing well. Take it easy. Subscribe. If you are new, like the video, if you enjoyed it and uh, yeah, Hope you will. Appreciate you guys. Goodbye. You later.